enjoyed the conference so far. Uh, my name is Peter Hessler. Uh, I'm with the OpenBC project, and in my uh, day life, I am also a uh, network administrator, a system administrator for a uh, managed server ho hosting company. Um, and so I'll be talking to you about uh, making sure my screen server doesn't start, <laughs> uh, about uh, using routing domains and routing tables in a production network. Um, uh, this started uh, several years ago um, when I was working for a company with Reich Floter, uh, another OpenBC developer, and uh, we uh, needed to solve some problems for that customers had. And uh, we did the development of this, and then I was the one who was going to the customer and, and implementing it with them and doing the support role and doing um, a lot of documentation for it. So um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the, exp some of the lessons I learned and, um, and how you can set your own, own writing, writing domains uh, network setup. So first off, let's have some definitions. Um, there's two aspects. There's routing tables, commonly called R tables, and then routing domains. And these are different but very related things. Uh, first is the routing table. So in your traditional uh, Unix system, in your traditional router, uh, you have a single routing table that contains all of the routes, uh, all the network routes that you know about and how to connect to it. And so most systems have one and only one available. Uh, in OpenBSD, with routing tables, you're allowed to have multiple routing tables and these are utilizing the same interfaces. So your firewall has four uh, Intel gigabit cards, so you have EM0, 1, 2, 3, and you're able to send your traffic over all three of them as necessary. Um, the IP addresses in the routing tables cannot overlap. You have to assign them, and they have to be globally unique. Uh, you can have a different path to get to the de end destination, however. Um, Multiple routing tables can belong to a single routing domain. And in the next slide, I'll go into what a routing domain is. Uh, so this is most commonly used for what's known as policy-based routing. Um, the most common example would be you have um, an office with two links to the internet. You have a DSL link and your cable modem link. The DSL link is very low latency, so it's very quick, but it's low bandwidth. So you, so you run into uh, so, so a large download will take a long time, but each packet will be sent very quickly. And on the cable modem, it will be a, uh, it'll be very high bandwidth, but also very high latency. So each individual packet will take a long time to transmit across, but you can get really high data rates. So if you're just downloading an update or you're viewing a web page or whatever, then most of your traffic will go over the cable modem. But for your voice over IP phone, each of the, the audio packets is very small, but needs to be sent very quickly and very reliably to the other side. Otherwise, you get the weird delays and possibly echoes and people over, over talking each other. So you use an alternate, so you use your main routing table to send most of the data over the cable modem. And then you simply mark the, the voice over IP traffic to go over the, uh, the regular uh, DSL link, so it's much faster. So a routing domain. What this is, is this is a completely independent routing table in a in different instance in, inside the kernel. This allows you to have, um, as I say in my example, is like the, the 10, 10 zero zero network. You can uh, assign it multiple times and you can have completely independent networks available for this. Um, an interface, however, can only be assigned to one writing domain at a time because when a packet comes in, how else would you know where to, where to route it and how to handle it and which writing domain is it for? Um, a writing domain always contains at least one routing table. Uh, for most people, they're gonna do a policy-based routing only on one routing domain. So most, most people do one or the other. It's not common to mix this in, in a production environment. Bit of the history, uh, the first edition of writing domains was at an OpenBSD 4.6 in October 2009. Uh, originally it was IPv, IPv4 only, 
Um, IBV6 support was finally added in uh, last year, in 2014. And uh, the main reason it took that long was my fault because I just slacked off on, on doing the work and <laughs> let, let the patch rot for about a year. And um, and then we get into a few more definitions. Um, VRF light and VRF are what's commonly known in the networking world. These were originally Cisco uh, definitions that Juniper and the other larger networky vendors had started using. So VRF light is simply multiple routing tables, or multiple routing domains, sorry. And this is generally done by hand on a single system and is designed for more of a smaller smaller entity um, that only that has will have one or two routers that need to do a lot of different customer interconnects into the system. VRF is also known as MPLS. Um, this gets a lot larger. This is interaction between BGP, um, LD uh, LDPD and usually requires larger networks. Um, if you were in uh, Ray's, Ray's talk earlier about uh, OpenBSD and virtual virtualization networks, you would have seen talk about overlay networks and underlay networks. Um, MPLS is often used as an overlay network on top of someone else's underlying network. And so a common example would be if you are a, you know, a large large regional or even national ISP, you have all of your routers at different points of presence within a, within a country, your customers connect to this, and then these will route your traffic over on top of possibly someone else's network. So that way uh, it still stays within your control, but you don't have to own all the physical links between you know, the, the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Um, when setting up a routing domain, um, so a rule in networking is that you must have a route to an end destination. And if you don't have a route, then the packet just gets lost and usually is dropped. For, for small uh, organizations, you will have a default route going to your, your main gateway going out to the internet. For a, a medium size enterprise, you can, you can have a BGP feed out and you'll get a full BGP feed and that's effectively a default route. Um, but when you're doing routing domains, a very common mistake that is done is to, not inc is to forget to create a default route within that routing domain. Um, in OpenBSD, when the packet arrives from the, uh, when the packet arrives from the network, we do a check, do we have any sort of valid route for this packet to be sent to? We do that check extremely early on, even before PF inspects the packet. If we don't have a route, we drop the packet uh, for, for performance reasons. Now, a very common use of routing domains is to, the packet comes in, use PF to steal the packet from that routing domain, and you spit it onto another routing domain, and in this case, that will fail. So what you really want to do is set up a default route in the routing domain as soon as you create it. Um, in my experience, I would say about 60% or more of all problems seen in production networks were simply forgetting to create a default route or simply creating a valid route for the destination system. So simply just set up a default route and you will avoid a lot of problems. Um, Sorry, yes. Are you suggesting to set up a default route in a routing domain even when it's a closed network with no default, with no real egress? Yeah, so the question is, is so on, on the, the real network side, you have a full, full feed of BGP and there's no real default. But on the routing domain, should I create a default route anyways? <clears throat> the answer is, while you don't strictly need to, all you have to do is create a route that exists for all of the destination networks. Mm -hmm. You can just do that, but it's extremely common to forget to update it. It's extremely common to not pay close attention 
And so, especially if you're doing this by hand and in a VRF light situation where you're not doing BGP routes across the networks, That is what dynamic routing is for, but if you're, if, so VRF light is by definition without dynamic routing in, in the domain, in the routing domain. <coughs> now in my examples, I'm using a default black hole route, which is perfectly legal, and that actually allows the packets to come in, be processed by PF, and then move to wherever it's supposed to go. Um, I'll get into a bit more of a, an example later of, of situations where I am doing just simply a, a very closed off link for the customer, for a customer network. <coughs> and then from there to their a default router for them, and then from there into a different routing domain. So from there, like it's, it's basically slash 24 within this side. Yes, there, there, so there is a diff, so, there, so what the check is, is, is there any type of route that exists for this packet? So, so this it is, is just some weird quirk of the implementation. It, it, is, it, is a beer, it, it is a quirk of the implementation, yes, that is correct. Um, this is a, an optimization for performance that was done. Um, it's, it was done a while ago. It may be worthwhile for us to, to reinvestigate this decision. However, in the current shipping code, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So even a default route just pointing to local host would... Correct. E a, default, a default route, anything that... So if you do, in OpenBSD supports a route get, and then you give it a destination address. If you do route get any, and it shows you anything that is not simply a... Uh, if it returns any value, then that's accepted. The real which next hop should be selected is done later. Sorry. I, I thought you were telling me that we had to put a default <coughs> route in pointing to an actual gateway. No, okay. no, no. My, in, my, in my examples that I'm using later, it's the default route is a black hole route to localhost. So there that is. There has to be a route entry. Exactly. There has to be a route entry okay. that is valid for this destination. Okay. So we, it, can be bogus. it can be completely bogus and usually is. And what you can also do is you can just simply create only for the destination networks they're allowed to talk to as well. Um, so it's just as long as it's, it's something valid for the destination, that's all that matters. Um, so yeah, the, the, and again, in my experience, it's when you're creating this all by hand and you're, and you're managing this without any sort of dynamic n routing, it gets very, very confusing of which routing table, which routing domain am I in? Where are the routes pointing? And so it's just much simpler just to add a simple default, um, whether, it, whether it's a regular default that makes sense for your network, or if it's just something bogus that, where you just black hole everything. Either, either option is perfectly le legit. Right, so the, the, right, so, so that, that part, is the, the, it, this is way before it even touches PF. This is done extremely early on in, in the whole flow, in the whole packet flow within the kernel. Yeah, so, but I will get to more, more examples and, and show that a little bit more later. Um, so yeah, so um, some of this can get very confusing and it's which routing domain is the packet in at any given time that determines how it's being routed. And it is important to, cons to keep that in mind. Um, so for a lot of people, they're not used to, to using a system with more than one routing table that's, that's installed and available. Um, and, and for a lot of users who are not familiar, uh, this is a very easy thing to forget about because they'll just look at the standard routing table and go, but I have a route. Why isn't my packet going out this way? It's in a different routing domain. And so you need to look at 
the writing domain it came in on, and, and then make sure that your tools that you're using to check and verify are utilizing the correct uh, routing domains. Um, and so, uh, as a very common, very common situation is that um, you can have completely independent networks going through the same router, and uh, it'll come in at an, on, a, on an R domain, and it'll go out onto a different interface in the same R domain, but what if you want to move it to a completely different routing domain for, um, for, for whatever reason? Um, in that case, you would use uh, PF. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll show an example of that uh, a bit later. So right now, we're just going to show you how to set up a very basic uh, example. Uh, in this case, we are taking the interface EM0, and we're going to declare this is going to be part of R domain 1. Um, by default in OpenBSD, every single interface is in R domain 0. Um, the reason why we set this first is because when you change an interface's routing domain, then what do you do? Is this a, still a valid uh, IP address for the system? Is this uh, the, the configuration that should be? And so in OpenBSD, when you set the routing domain, it will erase all the existing configuration on the interface, remove all IP addresses from it. So always set the routing domain first, and then you set the, uh, the IP address there. Um, it is generally recommended that you want to create a, uh, a local host, uh, a, a local host IP within the, the, the correct same routing domain. Um, in this instance, um, you can see that I have set up a default going to a gateway system 10.0.0.1. And then here I am running, um, I am executing the SSHD daemon, and it's being started in the routing domain 1, which is defined here with dash capital T. Um, what that allows you to do is you can start your, um, any arbitrary application within a specific routing domain. And so all incoming connections, it can receive connections from that domain, and then all of its outbound traffic is sent over that routing domain. Um, so this can be used to set up, for example, a management network that is not accessible from the regular part of your network. And so this is uh, the output that you see from it. Um, you can see right here, this declares that we're in running domain one, everything else looks the same. He again here, running domain one, everything else looks the same as you would normally see. And then here we take a look at the, um, the netstat output to see the routing table. And again, you set uh, minus capital T1 to set, to declare which routing domain you want to look at. And then, this is uh, the standard output of this, so you can easy, easily look at it and understand it as you would normally look at it from, uh, from an administrator perspective. And then this is an example of some PF rules that you can, that you can use. Um, the first rule here is any traffic that comes in and being sent to this IP address, we want to move it to the routing table number two uh, in this case, it would generally be part of the routing domain number two. Um, this is how you would move traffic from one routing domain to another one. Uh, in this case, it's not doing any address rewriting, so um, the destination and source IPs would need to be unique on both sides, otherwise the systems will get a little bit confused. Uh, not, not the OpenBSD side itself, because it understands what the um, the, which destination it is, but once it leaves OpenBSD, it goes into just the regular network. And so the network itself would have no knowledge of which routing domain this is. Uh, quick question, does PF create the appropriate stateful re return route back? Uh, yes, PF does create the, all the correct uh, stateful rules, so you don't need to do any crazy tricks for the return traffic. Yes, that's correct. Uh, here you're able to do an anchor, and you can say that everything within this anchor applies for any packet involving writing domain number 15, and then you can just do your standard standard rule set, and you, you don't need to worry about uh, doing you know received on this interface or whatever. It's just all, this block only applies to that writing domain. 
Uh, here is a, a slightly more complex example. Pass in that was received on this routing domain. We're going to do a redirect to the localhost 4, generally the loopback address, and send it to writing table 2, or I'm sorry, writing table 4, and that just steals the traffic and moves it over. And then same thing on the last rule, doing an outbound NAT. <coughs> so as I mentioned, we, uh, we ran this in production, and as we were running it in production, we saw a lot of interesting, we saw a lot of interesting things. Uh, the first one is the, the route exec. Um, originally, as this was designed, it was, it was simply an tool, internal tool for us to help work on the development of this, so we can add the, so we can later on add support to a lot of the utilities. We discovered this was an amazingly useful tool that we can just use and, and should be made a generic option available. Um, there was a s short period of time where we made a push to add very specific routing domain support into all of the tools that had any sort of access to the network. Like, for example, adding our domain support natively within SSH or within, within uh, you know, various other tools. And we later realized it was much, much better for us to add it simply within this route exec command and just use that as a tool to go forward instead of trying to add it for every single, every single daemon or tool or whatever. Um, so, we decided that only the specific network tools that have to know about routing domains, so basically anything that sets or checks a route, has native support. But everything else, you really should be using route exec if you can. And yet for OSPFD, our domain is a global setting. That is a, yeah, so that is a different thing. Um, that was because it was much easier to deal with, with the, uh, the route decision process, route decision engine, and that is something that we definitely need to expand on. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, don't use OpenBSD for cross-routing domain use cases yet? Or for multiple R domain use cases? So. In, in that case, what I've actually done usually is run multiple OSPFD instances and each one inside their own, own uh, routing domain. Uh, another thing is that OSPF, <coughs> because it, it looks at all the interfaces you're doing, that you simply just keep this with, that it's, it's not supposed to do anything cross. It, OSPFD should not do any, any cross routing domain stuff. BGP. BGP can, cr can cross-pollinate, yes. <coughs> uh, BGP is also used for, uh, full, for full MPLS. So it definitely has to know about this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, right, so as I mentioned earlier, um, when you add a routing domain to an interface, it erases the IP address configuration on the interface. Um, we looked at that as a way to to avoid uh, people leaking out information from their network because on, on a routing domain network, just because you have 10.0.0.1 doesn't mean that this, that has the same meaning within all of your routing domains. It may, it may not. So the first thing it does is it erases the IP address configuration. Um, however, the interface uh, routing domain is independent for the physical interface and any virtual interface sitting on top of it. So you can have the physical interface, EM0, in, in a routing domain. You can have the trunk sitting on top of that in a different routing domain. You can have VLANs sitting on top of the trunk in a completely different routing domain. You can have multiple VLANs all in their own routing domains, and there's no issues at all with this. Each of these are real, full-featured, full first-class citizen interfaces. So there's no issues with mixing this. So you're able to do you have your 10 gigabit link into the switch. You have all your VLANs coming in. Each VLAN is simply moved, marked on a different routing domain, and then you just process it as normal. Um, CARP is a little bit of a special case because CARP is half of an interface because of the design of it. And so CARP, CARP needs to be in the same interface as the parent, 
but that's the only restriction because of how of how cart behaves on the network yes. is there any difference in behavior when the trunk members are in a different R domain than the lag interface Ooh, I have not tried that I am I'm not sure I believe there should be no I believe there should be no difference in behavior but I have not specifically tried that. And that, that sounds interesting. I, I think I'll try that when I get back to the office. <laughs> yes? Uh, if I wish to uh, enforce that certain daemons or whatever are always started in a certain writing uh, uh, domain, um, it seems to me like I would perhaps want to do some Uh, so the question is, is how do I, what, what's the proper canonical way to define where, writing, where a daemon is being started, which routing domain it's being started in, at, at boot, or just when you're just running it as a program? Yes, it's twofold, yes. Yeah, it's, two, it's twofold, yeah. So the answer is, put the route exec command that you want with the daemon that you want inside rc.local. Uh, there is not any support within login.conf to enforce this for a specific class or for a specific user. And unfortunately, there's a lot of very ugly problems to try and solve by putting into the rc.d subsystem that have not been solved yet. And so because as an example, so like trying to do OSPFD, um, trying to start this, it's how do you, def is there a standardized naming for the configuration files? Is standardized naming for the the, the control socket that you would use OPF uh, CTL to talk to it, and that there is not a well-defined mechanism for this that exists in the RC.d subsystem. So you would need to specify that on both the on, on either the command line or in the uh, configuration files for this. So. For routing domains? Yeah, you just create your own custom RC script. And then you retain the ability to start this Ah, but that only works if you want to start it once. Ah, yes, okay, I'm sorry. The, the, there, there's two parts of this answer. So if you only want to start the, the daemon once, and you simply want to move that into a different routing domain, then yes, you would start it with the, if it had, I believe you're not able to specify a, a prefix command for in, in the rc.d subsystem. So you cannot prefix it with start it with route exec. If, it, if the tool does have native support inside a configuration file or as an option, then yes, you can do that in the rc.d subsystem. What I mean is do it, sorry to say, the Linux way. <laughs> Copy etc, etc rc.d ospfd to ah, yes. etc rc.d ospfd writing domain 2 and edit Script. Yes, okay, yes, you, you, you can simply just copy the, the, it over. Um, that would work. Uh, ugly. I'm, it's ugly, and I'm not sure I would call that as a, it's not part of the framework. Okay. <laughs> not <Yeah>. strictly. <laughs> um, you would have to do more than simply just edit rc.conf.local. And so, so anything within rc.conf local would, or, or with the RC CTL commands, that would be definitely be within the framework. I suppose at this point it's kind of a, you know, how, how do you define things? But yes, you absolutely could copy the rc.d script, edit that so it starts up, and, or you can, uh, generally what I have done has been to just put it into rc.local and specify it as necessary. Yeah, so the, the question is, is, is there a guarantee that the 
traffic from one routing domain will not move to another routing domain. Yes, that is, that is a strong guarantee that is provided. Um, so the running domain is stored both in the process and within the, and within the routing table that it's using. And so a, a process in routing domain zero can move to a different routing domain. However, a process that is in, routing, in any other routing domain cannot move outside of that routing domain without root privileges. So if it's running as root, then yes, it can move away. But if you're worried about, about the quality of software and trying to escape comment, uh, car, uh, trying to escape this sort of thing, then you shouldn't be running as root. So <laughs> that's a very clear answer. And uh, yes, within the routing table, within the routing domains, it cannot escape to another routing domain. You are allowed to tag the traffic and move it over with PF. But that is a administrative decision that you've made and you'd have to load in the rule set. And you can only load in the rule set as root and again, if you're root, game over. So yes, um, I, I have used this in the past, especially for a management domain. And so you can you hop in with you with an SSH from the outside, you hop into a machine, or you can SSH out to another machine to another management network. So it's much much more difficult for traffic to accidentally go into that destination or or to cross that that boundary. Yeah, exactly. ends up pointing back at the table. Uh, yes. This is, this is useful when you, when you have, uh, say, two carriers. Correct, and, yes. And you, you just want the return packets mm -hmm. to go back where they went without changing any code at all in the service. Right, so that is precisely what this, this uh, PF configuration does. But you have to use PF for that? Did yes, that is correct. You have to use PF to, uh, PF is used the classification uh, part to move across a different routing domain. Um, the isolation is guaranteed and is hardwired within the system, and you are unable to escape it without using um, something outside of the system. So, like if you send the traffic out and it goes through a switch and then comes back in, then it c then it's now on the routing domain that it was received on, or you can utilize PF to do this. No, the, in, the inbound routing is put into whatever routing domain the interface is on. And then once you receive it, then you can move it. So in this example, there's no in or out direction. So, so I, can, uh, I can have my port 80 web server just listen to port 80, and it gets, uh, it gets connections from all routing domains? Yes, that is correct. That's, that's, with this rule, you would just add proto TCP port 80. And then that's exactly what it would do. This would send uh, all traffic. I'm missing that. Uh, the inbound traffic. Yes. Uh, you're, you're using that rule to ship all the inbound traffic to one routing domain? Yes, that is that. So in this rule, we pass traffic in any direction, in or out, from any IP address to this IP address we specify 10.4.0.4. And when we receive it, we move it to routing table number two. And in this case, routing table number two is defined within our domain number two. And so this would move all of the traffic from everywhere that's been received into a single, and because it's, it's on routing domain any is, the, the, is kind of the, the sub part that is not, not printed there. So that's what the, the first rule uh, the, the top rule is doing. And so um, you can use this for like, like a, a web server or a monitoring system or a, or a backup system or anything else that you want to be widely accessible to all, all of your systems. Yeah. 
And of course, if you want to do, if you want to receive traffic from multiple routing domains and move them all to the same one, then you need some way to guarantee that this uh, destination route is sent to you from all of those routing domains, and this destination IP address is sent to you, it is delivered to you from all of the routing domains. And I'll go into an example a little bit later about how you can deal with this if it's not a unique address. So for example, if you have, it's so like in this case, none of the, none of the routers on the outside of you are allowed to use 10.4.0.4, because otherwise traffic will be delivered to that system. But if that IP address is utilized by someone on one of those routers, I'll show you an example a little bit later of how you can still receive that traffic if they send it to a different destination IP than, than what everyone else is using. All right. Uh, the other thing is that when we, uh, we first added uh, the support, we only had support for the, for, one routing, for the new routing domain. We received traffic and we moved it to the new routing domain. And this, we ran into a little bit of a problem with the FTP proxy command because FTP proxy needs to set up rules going in both directions. So it has to know the old and the new routing domains. And when we discovered this, the traffic was coming in on not the default routing domain and was also being sent to not the default routing domain. So that created some, so we had to add support for this in, in a later step. Um, so as I mentioned before, the standard rule for running a service in multiple routing domains is either do the inbound trick or simply just run it again. Um, if you rerun NTPD again, you run into very interesting problems. Um, <laughs> I, I started up uh, five NTPDs in different routing domains on my laptop. And after about five minutes of the wall clock, my laptop was now in August. <laughs> 30 minutes later, I could have retired if I just utilized the year on my laptop. <laughs> it, it, it went totally crazy. So you really don't want to do that. So we did add actually very specific support within NTPD to support routing domains. You can specify the, um, it is listening on in one set of routing domains or for N, in N routing domains, you could run, set that as many times as you need to. And you can specify the servers that it's pulling in time from in arbitrary routing domains as well. So, and those are per, per uh, line options in the configuration file. So you can have uh, listen on star star, um, and you can have uh, server A is in running domain one, server B is running domain two, server three is in running domain 15. And so that way you can just pull it in without having to do uh, strange network tricks that unfortunately don't work in PF because the destination IP address of number two also exists as a client <laughs> in routing domain 35. And so then you could not simply just, just classify it and move it around. Um, so then we also, uh, after the first release with this, we discovered we, we needed the ability to say on a routing domain, we didn't care what interface it was on. We just wanted to make sure that anything within this routing domain was the only thing that we selected. So in the original release, this command was not possible. When this command was really what we wanted. And this command, in order to support this command, it, instead of just doing the very simple three rules, it was about four pages of rules that we had to create on the machine. And it was very error prone, very easy to mess up because you just make a single typo and like, like you, you press four instead of five in, in, in one line and then suddenly traffic is being leaked everywhere. <laughs> so we, 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 wanted, we, we discovered we needed to add that support later. So now I'll get into a bit of an example of what sort of uh, an example network that you can, you can create with VRF Lite and with just a pure routing domain network. 
Um, this is, was a very common scenario that I saw in a lot of organizations. You have a management network. You have two outbound routing domains. Uh, you have backup server. You have monitoring. Um, and so this was the design. This is a uh, very simple design that I um, modeled on several of the ones I saw. So you see. Uh, up at the top, the connection to the internet was using routing domain 20 and not the default routing domain. Um, we have the customer orange in, in 208, customer pink in 204, customer blue in 207. Monitoring server, backup server, and different routing domains as well. Because we want to enforce uh, if that no one can get to them without being extremely specific with inside uh, the network. Um, th this sort of this sort of design was requested by some of our customers. We were not able to convince them that was slightly overly complex. Um, in this case, the, the individual customer networks, you definitely want to have in, in independent routing domains. This would be a link from your central co-location hosting provider into their direct network. And as you all know, your, everyone simply runs 192.168.0.1 as their primary network. And you want to make sure that this traffic did not get leaped from orange to blue. That would be a very bad configuration for you. Um, I also made it a little bit overly complex to show you uh, some of the, the rules that you can create for it. Um, so this is showing for customer pink. Um, these are the configuration values that you would just simply use uh, at startup. Um, you see here you define a VLAN interface. It sits on top of trunk number four. Um, it doesn't matter at all what trunk is set up it, or what the trunk's parent is, as long as they're valid in some way, shape, or form. Um, we define the VLAN, then we define the routing domain. We give it a group name just so it's easier for us to, when we're looking at a uh, so it's just a label that we can use both in the output of if config and that we can utilize this within PF as well. To find the internet, uh, the IP address assigned to the machine, um, because this is dot one, it's very likely to be the, the default gateway or a gateway of some type for the customer. Um, and then we also created the local host, the 127 uh, address. Um, while this is not strictly a requirement, uh, I find it much easier to think about machines if I create the, if I'm able to somehow encode the routing domain within the interface name. And so it's just, it's just a, a little cheat sheet that I use to try and do that. So that's why I called it localhost 204. Um, you see here that I create the standard uh, localhost reject route. And then here I create a default route that's a black hole. Um, the customer only has the single slash 24 behind it, and there's no reason to send any traffic back over there. Um, any other default route that I create would either be a pathological case, or I just send, send that some machine back across the link, and any network packet that I'm not actually stealing and sending across the wire, sending to another routing domain, we we'll just ping pong back and forth, and obviously that's a bad thing. Um, this is the pf.conf that I, that I have for the customer. So you see all the packets that are received on routing domain 204. Um, we have a default block list. We pass in all the traffic that's coming in from the pink customer, and we just want to accept them and uh, not do too much filtering from them. Um, we want to pass uh, ICMP in both directions. We, you know, we all like ICMP using ping, trace routes, very nice. Um, we want to pass from the monitoring. The monitoring network is a special network. It has hooks into all the different routing domains itself natively. Um, so we just pass it into the pink network. Um, uh, so I did a little bit of shorthand here. The P colon net is the same as the pink colon network command. Uh, I just did that so it just fit on the slide. <laughs> um, you see here, pass, uh, pass port TCP to the backup server, port 873, that's the rsync port for those of you who don't have all of those port numbers memorized. Uh, we're sending it to the, <laughs> uh, sending it to routing table number six so the traffic is sent there directly. 
And we are doing uh, an outbound NAT rule being sent to an uh, external IP address that we have defined for them. And so you see here, traffic is, comes in from customer pink, received onto our firewall here on this, in this box, and is being sent out to the internet on, on routing domain number 20. Uh, and then down here, we have, because it's not being received on routing domain 204, we are moving it, uh, we have to move it outside of this anchor block. And so uh, in this case, it's just simply ICMP because it's, it's just sending just standard ping tests from the monitor, um, the monitoring system in, uh, on any, on any of the routing domains to the network and we're, being, we're redirecting it to running main, or route, yeah, the running domain at 204. Uh, this is the output of the, of the network table. Um, as you can see, it looks fairly standard to what people normally use, and this is a black hole route. Um, because we have the default route, any traffic that arrives on this interface uh, is then, it, accept, it, it passes the first check, goes on to PF. Um, as we see here, that uh, the traffic has to be moved out to writing table number 20 uh, here on the, bottom, on the bottom rule. If it doesn't match, then we can't steal it. And if, and if, we don't, if PF does not steal the traffic, then it's simply blocked or simply uh, dropped on the floor as a standard black hole. Uh, and then again, same thing with customer orange. Um, you notice that I use the same IP address for both orange and pink. And that is to illustrate that um, the traffic that comes in is, uh, they're, they're independent from each other. And traffic from the pink customer, even when it comes in and hits the firewall, the firewall has no route to the orange network in, within that routing domain. So it doesn't know how to get to it, so it's not possible for it to escape and move over. Um, although, because of this, you should keep in mind and make sure you also don't add routing within the switches between, <laughs> between the customer and the firewall, because if the switch gets it and moves the route, then it's not in the routing domain. And again, we see here just the standard uh, netstat output. Uh, and then customer orange, same thing, same thing. All very, very similar to each other. Um, so as I was, as I was discussing, uh, use the anchors. It's a very nice way to, to segment the, the rule sets from each other. Anchors within PF allow you to do either, you load uh, your own rules into the anchor from a program or from a PF socket. Uh, you can also simply, as I described, just add your own rules there directly, and it works as, a, as an AND statement. So you just say it's everything on this routing domain or everything on th from this network or whatever arbitrary thing you want. You don't even have to say, you just say make an anchor. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, those three lines from my first slide, from my first slide showing the anchor and on our domain feature, was able, we were able to reduce the three lines instead of being about 60 or 70 with fairly intense commenting and, try and descriptions of what was happening within the network. Um, we also need to keep in mind of how, the routing, how trying to cross routing domains work because the routing domains itself only exists within the single firewall system. Uh, in a VRF light situation, it's only on that one machine and does not exist on any other machine. They have no knowledge of this outside of the internal kernel structure. Yes? Does the MPLS implementation use routing domains internally to guarantee segregation? Uh, yes, yeah, so the question is, is does MPLS use routing domains to guarantee segre uh, segregation? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, that is a, a core feature of MPLS. And, Right, right, yes. In, in our MPLS, yes, absolutely. Um, and then here I'm just showing the, the diagram again. So after all those, all those slides of, of what the, each of them output, 
So yeah, so traffic from customer orange comes in, is in the routing domain and has to be moved or stay within that routing domain. It does not get moved for you. Right, and so that was everything I just described earlier. <laughs> Um, so this, this is a special thing just for the monitoring. Uh, we can see here that we have the monitoring server. It's in routing domain number one. And so uh, any traffic received on, on the routing domain number one, so in this case, it's traffic received from the monitoring network. Uh, we do some examples, and this shows you how to have the different destination IP addresses, because as we saw, all three of the customers are using the same address range. And well, and as you know, I can, I can see some people looking a little bit concerned about this. And unfortunately, that's reality. You don't always have full control over the entire path. And what this allows you to do is we declare that we're going to take this 198.19.204 subnet and declare this as this is the destination for all the the IP addresses that exist within uh, running table 204, which I don't quite remember which one they are, that would be in pink. So all of pink has a different set of IP addresses. And we use the cool trick here with bitmask, so we can just run write one rule that covers the entire, uh, entire um, network range. And because it's slash 24, the last octet will simply be copied from one address to the other. So you just have a one-to-one -one mapping, so it's much easier for you to think about and to, to create the, the, the rules. Yes? So if I had two routing domains, two reciprocal rules like this, yep. I could achieve full one-to-one -one map for like 10 slash 8 and add it to 10 slash 8. Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can use, so th this rule can, uh, can be used exactly to, to do a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between any arbitrary size of net mask, provided you actually have that space. So if you, yeah, so if you have two slash eights, and you want to nat one to one, and you don't want to give them back to Iana or RN, which you, you probably should do, at least one of them. <laughs> um, so th this is an example to show you how you can. Um, deal with that sort of complexity of how do you get, get through across when you do have conflicting addressing. <coughs> and again, we want the monitoring system to reach the backup system. And we're actually very happy for monitoring to tr do anything they want on the backup system. Because if you get to the monitoring, then there's going to be a lot of problems with your network anyways. Yes? So if I want, like, so if I have two customers, they both use 192.168.0.1 mm -hmm. as the server Yep. So I just declare fake addresses and use PF to resolve the fakeness? Yes, exactly. That's, that's exactly what this, this is de demonstrating. Okay. And you can use any arbitrary IP address you want. Um, I recommend something you control on your network. But yeah, you can use, pick anything, and it just does um, a redirect or a NAT or whichever uh, method that you want to use that makes sense for them. Yes? Yes. And I would like to have some user space program be like a for, uh, the default route for this routing domain is like a divert to for some program here that then goes to this other routing domain. Um, like relay B? Perhaps. Um, or like some firewall type thing in user space. Um, uh, how, what, how would I accomplish that? Ye you can do that in a couple different ways. One way is to force it go out one network, go through uh, an even like, like an independent device, goes out one network, goes through the device, comes in an, an, another network interface. Another method is that you can do a redirect rule to like um, a local host socket and the like local host's uh, port that it's received on there. And then you have the, you know, the, the outbound part of that. And then you just take that traffic and move it out. You can use tag um, 
the user declaration within PF. You can use the port, source, or whatever uh, information there. Um, there are there is a there are several options for that that's available. Um, if you are writing the program yourself, you can actually define that within the program. Um, you would need to get uh, write access to the PF socket, which usually requires root access. And so you can have in a privilege separated daemon, you can have a root process that only can, that only sets up the rules that you need. Um, FTP proxy is is a program doing exactly that. So you can simply take the, the FTP proxy, um, the FTP proxy code, and, and then uh, add your own content scanner or whatever whatever that you need to do within it. From there, uh, yes, right. You know about my, my patch for the Ether. I know that, about your patch. Um, that somehow never got into OpenBSD. So um, for political reasons, I don't know. So I, I had a patch where you can basically connect two V Ethers in different R domains. Yes. Like um, a crossover cable, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Internally, because for me, it was neat that I can connect R domains on layer two. So I could run DHCPD in one R domain mm -hmm. and DH client in the other, for example. And right. I yeah. can do trunk over it. And people said, well, you can use bridge, but actually bridge doesn't work. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're stalled within OpenBSD. Mm -hmm. Nothing is happening. And what do you think is, from your point of view, the need to have something like this? Um, so I remember that patch, and I, I liked the concept of it. I think the so what for those of you who couldn't hear um, the audio, the Reich was describing that there was a a patch that was not committed that allowed you to do a interface to interface uh, connection that would cross writing domains in a nice way for layer two, or or without having to go through the the network without having to go through layer three and requiring PF for that. Um, I think this sort of support is is important. Um, maybe it doesn't need to be its own device. Maybe Bridge should should learn how to do this. I'm not 100%. We would need a V switch for that. We, we don't have it in OpenBSD. Yeah, a, a V switch is definitely I think would be the the best solution for that one. But yeah, as as as, as Reich just mentioned, uh, we do not yet have a a V switch within OpenBSD. So that would be. We don't have a car, and we are longing for a spaceship. So. <laughs> Uh, this would be a nice thing to have. Uh, it hasn't been done. If anyone would like to write this, uh, please talk. To, please talk to Reich. <laughs> uh, uh, patches are always, always welcome. <laughs> um, I'm out of time. Hmm? Sorry. I don't. I don't know. I don't remember what time I end. <laughs> Okay. Um, it's a half hour break, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll talk uh, very quickly about full VRF. Um, so full VRF, also known as uh, uh, MPLS, a multi-label protocol switching, is uh, requires two pieces. Um, the first one is a label distribution protocol, which we handle in uh, LDPD, and that. Uh, passes along the MPLS labels that are necessary to, to build up um, your network. Each hop along has its own labels and, ha and builds up a small, a small uh, label database. It works conceptually similar to OSPF for those who are familiar with the online protocol. Uh, if you just kind of squint, it does. Um, a lot, a lot of the code was, was copied. The, in the implementation, the code was copied from OSPFD, and then heavily modified to handle the OSP, the the, um, the LDP protocol. Um, and then, in conjunction with that, BGP is utilized to distribute the end customer networks over the um, over the LDP network. Excuse me, that is built up on top of that. Um, unfortunately, I don't have 
uh, the time to talk about uh, MPLS networks and details. Um, Claudio Yecker uh, gave a terrific presentation at UBCCon in 2011. Uh, I strongly recommend that you read that paper that goes into all the great glorious details, gives a fantastic di network diagram that he used for testing, and all the configurations that you need to get running. Um, I don't know if there's video of that. If there is, I recommend it. If there isn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so, best practices for setting this up. Uh, again, as I said, default routes, default routes, default routes. In my experience, it was well over 60%, well over 70%. I would say a huge amount of my problems uh, with this went away as soon as I started doing a default route, as soon as I set up my first IP address within, within the routing domain. Even if it's just a simple reject route, and then I do the real routing on top of that later, Having the valid route for the destination is the most critical part of this. It will, it will save a huge amount of time for you. Um, pay attention to what's available within pf.conf. PF is, is really powerful and, and has a lot of information and has a, a, a lot of options in it. And it can get very complex, but the complexity allows you to do it. There's a lot of things that you can do, so you need to be able to, to enumerate all of them. Um, and I recommend that you spend extra time when you're planning out your, your any network involving routing domains or routing tables. It is not as intuitive as a lot of people would think it is. And that is a different way of thinking about your networking. Um, for those of you who do run networks already, um, you probably can remember that when you first started off, you spent a lot of extra time trying to understand how the traffic was being sent around. And you'll have a, a slightly shallower learning curve, but there'll still be a little bit of a learning curve as you get used to how this all works. Um, so just simply plan ahead, do, do all the, the good diagrams that you can, and that will help you out a lot later um, when you're trying to debug the network so you can remind yourself just what, just what it was that you try, were trying to do. Um, I need to give some thanks. Uh, first off to Henning, uh, Henning Brower uh, from OpenBSD who wrote the original multiple routing table support. Uh, he did it specifically to support the policy based routing that I mentioned early. Uh, Claudio Yecker, uh, he wrote, he actually did the implementation, did uh, huge amounts of this, uh, and he uh, was able to translate all the interesting uh, Cisco documentation about this into something that I could understand. Uh, he also dealt with a lot of, a lot of my, my questions uh, when we were getting up. Um, Reich Floter spent a lot of time and effort more on getting this to be available for us. Um, he's able to, to get a lot of the funding for this to be, to be taken care of, and he's able to get this into OpenBSD uh, via uh, the assets uh, from this company. Um, so, uh, are there any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.